And we're going to win so much. You're going to get tired of winning. You're going to say, please, Mr. President, I have a headache. Please, don't, don't win so much. This is getting terrible. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to AM Joy with Donald Trump. It, while Donald Trump is firmly ensconced in his golf club in Bedminster, New Jersey for the next two weeks. So he insists via Twitter it's not a vacation. And with members of Congress home for the August recess, the corridors of power in Washington, D.C. are going to be decidedly quiet this week. With one possible exception, the office of special counsel Robert Mueller. Mueller is using at least two grand juries to subpoena records and gather testimony. Now, you might forgive the party of Trump for not being in a winning mood, given all that. And also a recent Pew survey that shows that more Republicans believe their side is losing than winning. Combined with Trump's dismal approval rating, some Republicans are already daydreaming about life after Trump. The New York Times reports that a number of Republicans, including Senators Tom Cotton and Ben Sass and Ohio Governor John Kasich, are discarding the respect normally accorded to an incumbent president from their own party and making moves that do resemble those of early stage presidential campaigns. It's almost as if Trump's fellow Republicans think they might have a loser on their hands. Joining me now, Republican strategist Evan Siegfried, former White House senior director Nayara Haq, Democratic strategist Karine Jean-Pierre, and Kurt Bardella, former Breitbart media consultant. Um, I'm going to start with you right here at the desk with me, Evan. Donald Trump, uh, his numbers are not good, <laughs> to say the least. Let's just go through a little bit of this really stunning Quinnipiac poll. Uh, Trump's disapproval rating is at 61 percent. His approval is at 33, which is an historic low for the poll. His rating with Republicans is down around 76 percent. I know you and I have talked a lot about where that danger zone is, where other Republicans would begin to abandon him. Is that it? No, there's actually even more in there that's really bad news for him. Among white uh, non-college educated voters, only a 43% approval rating when he won 67% of that in the election. That's been his strongest yeah. supporters. Yeah. And when you're talking about what is going on here, why isn't President Trump doing well, and why are people see sensing weakness in him, which he yeah. truly is, it's because he's not been delivering. And at the same time, he did what every politician has done uh, over the years, which is he overpromised on the campaign trail, and he's been under-delivering every day. Yeah. That's why Republicans are upset and saying they're sick and tired of Trump's whining. We don't have these numbers, but I mean, uh, the, the Republican Party's numbers are really dismal, too, with uh, a vast majority of the country to one disapprove of their handling of health care. Are, are Republicans better off that he didn't manage to repeal Obamacare because it would have upset a lot of people who would have lost it? Or are they worse off because they, people wanted him to do it? Politically, we're better off in the long term because we're going to have to come to repair. Yeah. And taking away health insurance from 22 plus million people would not sit well. Short term, it's not good for Republicans because the base is very upset and talking about primary. You have Kelly Ward going after Jeff Flake. And Jeff Flake, just by standing up to Trump, dropped 18 points in yeah. Arizona, which is yeah. astounding and bad news for other Republicans. Absolutely. And Kurt, let's go through some of these other numbers because they are pretty stunning. Uh, this is also from the Quinnipiac poll. 62 percent um, of those polls said that Donald Trump is not honest. 63 percent say he does not have good leadership skills. 60 percent say he believes he's above the law. 59 percent he does not care about average Americans, which is usually the red flag number for reelect. Uh, 54 percent say they are embarrassed, embarrassed to have Trump as president. And then the next one, just his approval on specific issues, handling in the economy, another big red flag issue. He's only at 41 percent approval and the economy is actually pretty good. So that, that's not good for him. Foreign policy, even lower at 36. Terrorism, which is supposed to be one of his strong suits. He's 50, 50, 46, 47. Immigration. Look at that. 38 percent approval on immigration, 60 percent, 59 percent saying no way. And health care, even the worst of all, 28 percent. You know, at what point, Kurt, does this become a red flag number, just as I asked Evan, where sort of the base of the Republican party gets so small that Republicans in those 22 to 40 districts that are a little bit more middling start to walk away. Well, I think you're starting to see the beginnings of a presidency whose, whose base of support is really on the rocks here. Uh, you remember, this is a, a candidate who, who promised so much to happen so quickly, big promises. Walls were going to be built, Obamacare was going to re be repealed, it was going to be easy, everything was going to be fantastic. So a lot of these voters, a lot of whom, by the way, were just frustrated with war with both parties, with the whole process, believing that they were left behind by an establishment 
a, a Republican, Democrat controlled uh, institution that didn't care about them. They thought Trump was going to be the difference maker. And here we are now. We're almost eight months into this presidency. And none of the things that he talked about have materialized in any way. I think that when people voted for Trump, in a large part, it was about wanting to change Washington, wanting to have someone in there who was different from the outside, who could relate to them, who would, who would just by pure force of nature and will, create the change that they felt needed to happen. And instead of, of, of action, we've seen just paralyzation and stalling. And I think that, that that has a lot of voters, and particularly Trump's base, who, who just wanted so much to happen so quickly with nothing going on and everyone leaving town and he's on vacation and, and spending his entire presidency just on his phone tweeting about things. This is not exactly what they thought that they were going to get. Yeah, you see him there with a, a couple of his grandkids trying to use the, the, the grandkid gambit and it sometimes does work I and mean, make people think, oh, but I don't know if it's working for him. Uh, you know, Kareen, on the, on the Democrats' end of it, you know, we're starting to hear uh, about a Mike Pence possibility, whether or not, whether Democrats were to, let's say, take over the House of Representatives and somehow impeach Trump or he got tired of all this and resigned, whatever happened, um, the idea of Mike Pence, you hear a lot of Democrats talking about it. Uh, New York Times reporting on Saturday, multiple advisors to Mr. Pence have already intimated to party donors that he would plan to run if Trump did not run for re-election. The vice president created his own political fundraising committee, Great America Committee. He's over, uh, he has and it's overshadowed Trump's own primary outside political group, which is called America First Action, even raising more money in disclosed donations. Pence's spokesperson responded to this report on Twitter, saying that um, the, the claims that VP is preparing a run for 2020 are ridiculous and fake news, nothing more than wishful thinking by the New York Times. For Democrats, which would be a better outcome? Donald, a weakened Donald Trump to run against in 2020, Pence, so I know a lot of women are sort of dreading the idea of him being president. Yeah, I dread the idea as well of him being uh, president because Mike Pence could actually get things done if he were president because he's not as impulsive and, and inept as Donald Trump. But Mike Pence faces a, a bit of a problem because we have to remember he never ran in 2016. His base is Donald Trump's base. So he has to be really, if he this is truly true, uh, he has to be really careful on how he treads the line here because he can't piss off Donald Trump. Well, and if he if he does, he'll piss off Donald Trump's base, which is now his, right? He needs that base in order to really succeed if he does, if, if it does play out in, in fruition and, and he has to run in 2020 because Donald Trump doesn't. But uh, but look, I think that Democrats need to be uh, really focused. The focus is now on making sure that we beat back all the horrible things Donald Trump is doing, but also focus on uh, the 2018 strategy. And that is what we need to be doing. And I'm wondering, you know, Yuri, if, you know, the other sort of red, you know, sort of uh, thing that's hanging out there is the possibility that Donald Trump uh, may be able to try to worm his way back into the good graces of the American people using, quite frankly, and I hate to say this, national security. I mean, he's still, he knows he can go to the generals well whenever he's in, uh, in trouble. He's got now three generals around him working in, in uh, close proximity to his office uh, between General Kelly, General McMaster, and uh, General Mattis. Is it possible that Donald Trump could find his way back through NAT security? Oh, and then actually, there's a typical thing that autocrats do and people with autocrat tendencies do when their poll numbers are low or when they feel that the public isn't adoring enough, and that's try to declare war. So we have several hot button issues around the world right now, everything from North Korea, Iran, um, Mi Middle East writ large, Syria. There are plenty of opportunities for this president to distract the American public from his failed domestic policies and try to build support for a war overseas that he has commander in chief authority. He can do that. He has generals around him in civilian positions, so they, there is a tendency to not necessarily push back uh, on your commander in chief when you're when that's been your training for several years. And that's the difference between having a general of, or a military person versus a civilian is that back and forth dialogue. Uh, this is also a president who really likes the pomp and circumstance that comes with military parades. So all the psychological tendencies are there, as well as a set of issues that could very easily be distracted um, by declarations of war. And, you know, so first to you, Kurt, on this, um, because the other issue that, you know, the Breitbart world has been using to try to get Trump's numbers back up is this sort of deep state paranoia, the idea that there's a sort of slow motion coup taking place in the West Wing, that people like General Kelly and McMaster are undermining Trump and trying to take over and push out the Breitbart uh, sort of contingent out of the White House. Does that work in terms of keeping Donald Trump's base in place and keeping them paranoid enough to stick with him? Or at some point, will that even start to wear thin? 
Oh, I think for a while it'll keep them at bay because again, a lot of folks who go to Breitbart who, who are Republican primary voters, that's one of their scariest sounds, their only source of information. And so you're, you're, you're communicating to your own kind of echo chamber there. And, and, and I think that that's, as long as they keep pumping out that kind of content and, laying, and, blaming it and putting the blame elsewhere, they're, they're, I think there's a good chance that they won't abandon Trump. I mean, I think that there, there's 20, 25 percent of Republican voters who under no scenario will ever abandon Trump because they've bought into the idea that there is this conspiracy, that there is the fake news media that's in on it. And I wouldn't be surprised as time goes on and, and, and if Trump's failures continue to mount up, if he starts turning on everybody uh, in Congress, if he starts pointing the directive at both Republicans and Democrats are the problem. Them. Let's throw all of them out in the midterms because really, if you're Trump, the best case scenario is a throw the bums out mentality because that means both Republicans and Democrats will end up getting kicked out and we'll have a whole influx of new members of Congress come in next November. And whatever losses Democrats might get, some Republicans will be on the target list too. Yeah, it is an interesting sort of strategy, right, Evan, the idea of trying to come in with a sort of a fresh slate Congress, even a, a Democratic controlled Congress that, you know, he might be able to actually make e easier deals with them. But, but let, let's talk about the other thing that Donald Trump is doing, which is trying to sort of uh, go back to the well. Uh, the Clinton well. This is Donald Trump in West Virginia going after uh, a familiar foe. Take a listen. The Russia story is a total fabrication. What the prosecutors should be looking at are Hillary Clinton's 33,000 deleted emails. They can't beat us at the voting booths. So they're trying to cheat you out of the future and the future that you want. You know, Dr. Jason Johnson described this on the show yesterday as Donald Trump can't quit his ex, right? But I mean, I, I wonder to what extent uh, the Clinton well is still potent in, I mean, they beat her, right? They got what they wanted. I mean, is, is the base not sated yet with enough uh, sort of damage to, Clinton, to Hillary Clinton, or is she still a, a potent sort of message? Because it's interesting that they're going after her and not Barack Obama. She still is a potent message because Republicans for decades have hated the Clintons. Clearly. And when she, after the race, when there were the photos of her showing up in normal places, she was still being mocked on social media. So it does work for the president to target Hillary Clinton in his speeches, but it doesn't show, change the fact that, dude, you won. Let it go and get over it. Yeah. You're president now. Put on your big boy pants. Are, are, are Republicans con uh, do, do Republicans think that they can use this? Well, you do have some House Republicans trying to even float the idea of having an independent counsel go after Hillary Clinton as a way to try to shore themselves up. Do Republicans really think that they can win the midterms based on issues like from the, you know, the, the early 2000s? Thousands. Is that what they really think? Well, they have to excite their base. And when you, mm -hmm. as Kurt said, when you have Donald Trump starting to trend away, look at all of his tweets history and how he refers to Republicans. It's not we. They. It's not. It's always they. Yeah. You are. Uh, he never identifies as one. It's Trump. And by the way, Republicans are with me until I turn on them because they're the problem now, not me. Yeah. And, and you know, Kareem, then how long does it, you know, a cult of personality gets you 25 percent, 25, 30 percent of the electorate? You know, at some point, you, you know, Democrats are not the most united bunch in the world either. But do Democrats have a strategy to fight that? If all Trump is down to is his hardcore 30 percent, do Democrats have what it takes to get themselves back into power? Well, I hope they do, Joy. I mean, look, we, what Democrats need to do is, first of all, not turn fire against each other. And what we've been reading in the last couple of days about, you know, the progressive and the centrist, they need to really stick together and focus on Donald Trump, all the bad things that he's doing, but also figure out what is the strategy? Can we win the House back? How does that look like? Focus on those 23 districts that Hillary Clinton overperformed that were, that were Republican district. What else are we doing? And that is the key here. We need to come together and, and focus. Focus. 2020 is, is down the line. We'll have a lot of time to figure that out. But that is that is the, the, the thing that I think Democrats, I hope that they don't lose their focus on. Yeah, absolutely. We will have all of this panel back. Great panel. And coming up, Jefferson Sessions is playing tough with leakers. But well, my next guest says, bring it on.